Thank you, John. Um, and thank you for joining us. Um, this could not be a timelier, more enduring topic. Uh, we're on the eve of major gathering COP26 in Glasgow. Uh, the UN uh, Secretary General has called the climate crisis a red line for humanity. Uh, and there are um, no longer any rational evidence-based reasons uh, that we don't understand this is the far biggest danger facing us. And in that context, the Arctic has emerged as the flashpoint for climate crisis. As, and as a key example, and this is why the group, uh, the American Committee for US-Russia Accord, we have a few board members on the call, Cynthia, Anatole, John Pepper, why we're doing this, because we believe that um, we need informed dialogue about the crises and that without collaboration and cooperation, there is no real international security. But today we have three remarkable people. Uh, we have a multi, we have a, a kind of common European beyond from Vladivostok to Moscow, to Lisbon, to Hawaii, to the uh, New York, provincial New York. And we have two people uh, who just, well, three, uh, Pavel, you'll hear, has just returned from the Arctic Council. Uh, Katya Europova has been doing some important path-breaking research and Anatole just returned from the annual gathering in Valdai, uh, where I doubt this was the central issue, but it's always important to understand what has come out of that gathering. Just briefly, uh, Anatole is a senior research fellow on Russia and Europe at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. If you don't know about the Quincy Institute, check it out. Uh, professor, journalist in South Asia, former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe and covered the wars in Pakistan, Chechnya, Afghanistan, Southern Caucasus. His new book, which is I think out in paperback or coming out soon is very uh, relevant to our discussion today, climate change and the nation state. Yekaterina Katya um, is a visiting fellow at the Arctic Institute. And if you don't know about the Arctic Institute, it's a fascinating grouping, check it out. Her areas of expertise revolve around climate change, science, fishery, and environmental policy. And her research has been focused very deeply on Russia's Arctic an Antarctic engagement. Uh, she is, uh, she, she's worked, been working in the polar regions for more than 10 years and has had <laughs> the animals of the Arctic, but the politics and geopolitics. Pavel has just returned from uh, the Arctic Council meeting. He's a research associate leadership group member at the Arctic Institute a research fellow at the Stanford US-Russia Forum. And his research areas include Arctic cooperation, security, climate change, and socioeconomic development. Um, it is, his work has appeared uh, in the Quincy Institutes uh, for Responsible Statecraft publications and High North News and the US Department of Defense. Um, yesterday, there was, I think, not well titled, article, which again shows how timely this topic is in the New York Times, Russia cashes in, I think, on climate change. Uh, it's an interesting story, but I think, you know, all countries are in different ways cashing in on climate change, but it was about the Arctic and the geopolitics and the economic development that is going on. Uh, so again, very relevant to this conversation. So I wanted to begin with Pavel, uh, then turn to Katya, and then to Pavel, and we'll open it up for some Q and A um, after that. So thank you all for joining us. I'm going to turn to Anatole. Can you? Ah, you're mute. You need to unmute. Uh, me? Yes. I, I thought we were starting with Pavel. No, we're going to start with you, if that's okay, sort of the bigger oh. picture, and then go to Katya about the Arctic, more specifically the research. Oh, okay, that, we that's can fine. Always... Really. Uh, although I should, uh, I, I should uh, apologize. I feel a, a terrible fraud um, talking about the Arctic. I've never actually 
been in the Arctic, um, <laughs> like most people I've observed it from, from afar. Um, well, uh, just very briefly to, to start off with, um, I want to say, and you know, this very much reflects the argument I make in my book, uh, that the Arctic is the most uh, important area of the world for mankind at the moment, for the whole of humanity and the future of humanity. Uh, because um, the Arctic uh, is warming at around twice the rate of the rest of the planet. And the Arctic is the location uh, of the greatest, I mean, the truly cataclysmic threats of climate change uh, to humanity in general. Uh, the, the threats that uh, so-called tipping points will lead to uh, feedback loops uh, leading to runaway climate change, uncontrolled climate change, which will be beyond the, the, the possibility uh, of humanity and of organized states to, to manage. Um, and uh, these are concentrated uh, on two threats in particular. Um, one is, of course, the melting uh, of the Arctic ice caps, which uh, threaten not just, of course, catastrophic rises in sea levels, but also by reducing the reflectivity of sunlight uh, into space, uh, then contribute to the warming of the oceans, uh, which in turn then risks the uh, a, a feedback loop um, whereby two degrees uh, rise in temperatures turns into three, three turns into four, turns into five. Now, uh, it has generally been assumed in the past that uh, changes on this scale, which have, of course, occurred a number of times uh, over the, the history of the Earth, uh, would take place over thousands of years. Uh, in other words, a time frame, you know, well beyond the conventional time frames of, of human history, which would allow us time to adapt. But there are highly disquieting suggestions um, that at certain moments uh, in the past, uh, including the relatively near past, the last ice age, uh, in fact, you got uh, temperature changes of, five, of around five degrees centigrade within a few decades. Now, if that were to happen, it would overwhelm uh, the possibility of organized states and societies to respond, uh, because one would be looking at um, uh, you know, rises in sea level, changes in agriculture, uh, which no, no human society could, could cope with, uh, because, I mean, amongst other things, of the huge numbers of people involved. And the second uh, possible tipping point, God forbid, and feedback loop, which has been uh, most commonly identified, uh, is the release of methane from the mm. Arctic permafrost. And uh, this unit you know, is already visible in Siberia and in northern Canada and Alaska. I mean, this, this, this is not a, you know, a, a speculative or fanciful idea. It is happening in front of our eyes. Now, Methane, uh, although it uh, doesn't last nearly as long in the atmosphere um, as carbon dioxide, while it does last, uh, has a, a greenhouse gas effect approximately 38 times that of, of carbon dioxide. Uh, and colossal quantities of methane are trapped um, in rotting vegetation in the Arctic permafrost uh, and under the Arctic Sea. Uh, the release of that over a short period of time would lead to catastrophe for the whole of humanity. So the Arctic, as I say, is the most important area for all of us, um, for the future uh, of the human race. And um, Russia uh, is, of course, the largest, by far the greatest Arctic state. Uh, it has a huge share of the responsibility for what happens there, though, of course, um, the climate change is, is driven by all of us. You know, Russia plays you know, a, a not insignificant, but relatively small part. Uh, now, coming to Russian government policy, I mean, ha I'm happy to say, you know, coming from the Valdai conference and um, listening to President Putin, uh, compared to 
shall we say, five years ago, uh, I'm happy to say that the Russian government and the Russian political establishment does now uh, recognize that climate change, anthropogenic climate change is happening. Mm. In the past, there was a great deal of, of flat denialism. Uh, there is a recognition that it's a serious problem. There is a recognition that states need to cooperate against it. Uh, I, I would say, however, that there are still um, some fairly substantial problems uh -huh. in Russian official attitudes. Uh, of course, <laughs> as there are all over the world, you know, I mean, none of us have the right to any degree of self-righteousness in this regard, uh, including the Europeans who, you know, if you look at their actual record, many of them, as opposed to their rhetoric, are you know, not nearly as good as they claim to be. But I would say, um, talking only about uh, Russia, uh, there are uh, a couple of sort of specifically Russian points, and then um, actually maybe not specifically Russian. Uh, I would say to listening to Putin and listen and talking to some other officials that uh, there is um, too much concentration on the threat to Russian nature. I mean, not, not that this is, you know, insignificant or bad. Um, it is a threat and it's, you know, if people care about all over the world, you know, if they care about the, the natural orders of their country, then this is, you know, this is a great motivator uh, for environmental concern, and climate change action. But still, I mean, it's not the, you know, the, the biggest threat in the Arctic is on a vastly larger scale than that. Uh, then there is the, the threat to national infrastructure, um, which is significant. It's been estimated that by the middle of the century, 20% uh, uh, of infrastructure in Siberia will be negatively affected. Uh, by the melting of the permafrost, for example. Uh, and we have already seen near Norilsk one very major uh, disaster to an oil pipeline um, to which apparently the melting of the permafrost contributed considerably. Uh, so that is an issue, but once again, it's not the biggest issue. Uh, then there is something which um, I find uh, that the... Um, the, the, the Russian security establishment shares with that of the United States and Canada, which is, of course, a very typical and sad irony because the American security establishment and the Canadians, you know, build up Russia as the great security threat in the Arctic. Oh, and China, you know, the, the, the biggest threat up there is that the melting of the Arctic ice will allow Russian ships to sail through the Arctic, which is an exercise, I have to say, in missing the point, about as comprehensive as anything seen in the history of our security establishments. And that, by the way, is really saying something, given you know, their historic record. Uh, but I mean, clearly for nobody, for nobody in the world, including the Arctic powers, uh, is, is the fact that ships will be able to sail more easily. Uh, I mean, it's still sea after all, you know. And then most irrelevant of all um, is the question of, of course, claims to undersea oil and gas reserves, uh, which as we are told again and again and again, must be left quietly under the sea if we are to have any chance, you know, of limiting climate change. So all of these, I would say, are um, still by no means confined to Russia, uh, but um, things that I found uh, a trifle disturbing in the Russian response or inadequate. Uh, and then, of course, there is the fact that, um, and by the way, not perhaps wholly unjustified, uh, but a great many people in Russia are still assuming that on balance this will be good for Russia uh, because, of course, of the warming of Siberia and the shift of agriculture northwards. Uh, but um, as I have repeatedly told uh, Russian contacts and friends, um, this assumes that Russia can somehow be isolated from the, catas the likely catastrophic effects of climate change further south on Russia's borders. And it would be very, very unwise for the greatest Eurasian territorial state with thousands and thousands of kilometers of borders with other countries to think that it could isolate itself from climate disaster elsewhere. So just, I mean, to finish and leading on to what my colleagues are going to say, um, I think that the Arctic is a tremendous 
example and argument for uh, the need for technological cooperation between Russia and other states, Western states, the United States, a cooperation which has been um, tragically interrupted uh, by what I regard as, a, you know, not insignificant, but essentially extraneous and secondary geopolitical um, issues. Uh, it's urgently necessary that this be resumed, uh, joint research be resumed. And in particular, there is one area which I hope that we never have to resort to, but I think it would be irresponsible and foolish not to recognize the fact that we may, if, you know, if we fail now to limit climate change adequately, ultimately, God forbid, God forbid, but we may have no choice but to resort to measures of geoengineering in the Arctic, not in the, in the climate as a whole, that would be impossible and ridiculous. But because the Arctic is the source of the greatest threats, concentrated measures in the Arctic might one day be necessary. Uh, I think it would be good to begin to look ahead to that because one thing is absolutely certain. If these measures are, do ever have to be undertaken, it is essential that they be cooperative. Um, if, if countries start playing competitive geoengineering, that will be a catastrophe for humanity. And if there ever is geoengineering in the Arctic, then Russia, by definition, as the greatest Arctic power, has to be part of that. Thank you. Thank you, Anatole. Um, thank you. And uh, we will ask Katya to uh, present. Thank you. Absolutely. I hope uh, everyone can hear me clearly. Thank you, Anatole. It was interesting. And um, uh, uh, I just would like to say that the Arctic is just wonderful. I have been there for many, many times, and I would like to be back uh, if I have a chance again. And uh, just would like to show you some pictures and uh, share some knowledge about this uh, region and yes, here we go uh, so i hope you can see uh, my presentation clearly so i'm very excited to talk about the arctic today here and in my brief introduction i'd be glad to touch the following topics as climate change risks challenges uh, impacts in the Arctic and surely uh, opportunities to cooperate. And as one of the Arctic Council's working groups, the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program reported in its 2021 Arctic Climate Change Update that the Arctic has warmed up not two, but three times more than the rest of the globe over the last 50 years with adverse consequences for Arctic environment, biodiversity, indigenous peoples and local communities and for the globe climate system. Um, and with this slide, I would like to show you uh, that we have uh, different definitions of the Arctic used by scientists. So we do use terms of high, low Arctic and sub-Arctic according to various environmental and biological characteristics and we use different lines in the Arctic. And how do we usually study and me measure climate change? So we use uh, sophisticated instruments and satellites to measure climate parameters. Looking back through time by studying ice cores and sediment cores that provide indirect evidence about past temperatures and other climate conditions are also good. So the most common climate observations are of temperature and precipitation. Other climate variables include humidity, wind speed and directions, air pressure, cloud cover and solar radiation. So many, many parameters that we use to study the Arctic, which is very interesting because we do not actually use them on a daily basis. So the most common climate observations are of temperature and precipitation, as I said. Uh, other climate variables include humidity and many, many things that 
uh, scientists uh, can study uh, using different uh, sophisticated tools. Without or urgent action, uh, the world will continue to feel the effects of a warming Arctic. Among them uh, should be mentioned rising sea levels as a result of melting inland ice and sea ice, changes in climate and precipitation patterns, increasing severe weather events and loss of fish stocks, birds and even marine mammals, permafrost saw, uh, substantial negative impact on indigenous peoples, and there are many other ones. And uh, from my personal uh, experience, I would even say that the climate uh, in the Arctic uh, is changing. Of course, all of us, we know about this, but it's not just coming warmer. Uh, it's not becoming uh, warmer as we uh, continue to think about this, but also it's becoming more extreme. And if we come back to my uh, first slide, you can see this is uh, one of the pictures that I took this season um, in June. So never expected to see this uh, sea ice uh, in the Sea of Okhotsk. So, but anyway, the weather is becoming extreme. This is the fact. And one of the important pieces of the climate change puzzle is permafrost. So permafrost is typically defined as a ground layer with the temperature remaining at or below zero degrees centigrade for at least two consecutive uh, years. Every year, the surface layer of frozen ground that freezes in the winter, but so in summer is referred to as the active layer. This is what we are interested in when we study permafrost. The active layer will freeze again in the autumn, for sure. Changing climatic conditions affect the state of permafrost in direct and indirect ways. So among the factors that influence the frozen ground are rising air temperatures, changing snow regimes, and condition of vegetation. So we know now that permafrost covers around 22 million square kilometers in the Arctic. So we can find uh, permafrost in Canada and Russia and uh, the US state of Alaska. And uh, uh, behind the borders of uh, uh, the polar circle, uh, we can find also permafrost in China. So, but. Uh, what about the near future? So the area of near surface permafrost in the Northern Hemisphere is projected to decline by 20% relative to today's area by 2040, and could be reduced by as much as two thirds by 2080 under a scenario of high greenhouse gas emissions. And why is it important to, to monitor permafrost state? So with sowing permafrost projected to release significant amounts of carbon and methane in response to climate change, as well as being a reason for ground subsidence. It may even reawaken dormant diseases, as you probably know from some of the recent papers. Widespread permafrost degradation is permanently changing local hydrology increasing the frequency of fire and erosion disturbances. That's what we actually witnessed the last summer. Moreover, uh, the environmental transformations caused by climate change affect indigenous peoples and their traditional way of life. According to researchers, a significant, approximately 25% decrease in the urban infrastructure stability throughout Russia uh, I mean, I'm talking about the permafrost region of this country, should be expected by the mid of 21st century already. So in general, observational data on permafrost characteristics are limited. Currently, most permafrost data remain fragmented and restricted to national authorities, including scientific institutes. So while nations maintain excellent individual permafrost research programs, a lack of shared research, especially data, significantly reduces effectiveness of understanding permafrost overall. So this is very important. We should collaborate in this area and uh, in general in area of data sharing. And uh, some of uh, 
uh, recent data from the Arctic. Um, again, this is one of my recent publication. And here's one uh, of the results of the, the work we did uh, this summer in, in the Pacific sector, uh, no specific sector this year. We have recorded mass seabird die-offs along the coast of Chukotka. Chukotka is the Pacific coast of Russia. So our colleagues from the United States have mm -hmm. also described similar trends in the Northeast Pacific area, in particular in the Bering Strait region, Aleutian Islands and the Gulf of Alaska in May, September, 2021. So we have found um, uh, uh, the reason why it has happened but anyway, uh, uh, we also found that a warming ocean causes a decrease in the number of zooplankton, zooplankton organisms. And as a result, uh, we have less fish available in the region and birds then have to cover long distances to find food and often ineffectively. Anyway, some positive news again about uh, uh, collaboration uh, in the Arctic region. So the Fulbright Arctic Initiative creates a network to stimulate international scientific collaboration on Arctic issues while increasing mutual understanding between the people of the United States and the people of other countries. And as a, an example, in March 2021, US Embassy in Moscow and the Fulbright program in Russia and the Institute of International Education in Moscow welcomed more than 30 participants to a two-day international seminar focusing on ecological, social, economic, and political development in the Arctic. So uh, that was good so, to have this event. So, so, and also to see some people focused on Arctic issues. And another example of collaboration between two countries. So the Nansen and Amundsen Basin's observational system, which is also called NABOS, this is the expedition to study the climate changes in the Arctic. And uh, just for your information, it ended on October 19th. So it means last week. Mm. Uh, very important data were collected and scientists have spent on board about one month and they have collected important data. All this data will be downloaded in uh, the special uh, database and uh, here are the main results of the expedition. And during this expedition, scientists have taken more than 9,000 water samples and tested them on board. The ocean and the hydrochemical data received this year will add to the database, which continues from 2002. During this expedition, the vessel covered more than 6,000 nautical miles and the scientists went on the drifting ice three times the expedition had planned to conduct studies in the um, Laptev, yeah. East Siberian seas and in deep water areas of the Arctic Ocean. Also, scientists have noticed consequences from the climate change in the Arctic. So back in 2002, when this expedition started, um, uh, research vessels could get to designated areas only following icebreakers. But nowadays, they um, the power of ice class vessels is sufficient for such voyages as well. And a very important conclusion from this expedition that the oceans play, uh, they play more important role in the climate of the Arctic, uh, not the atmosphere as scientists said before. So, and one more uh, contribution to successful international collaboration in the Arctic is a multi-year study that scientists do uh, on Wrangel Island in the Pacific sector of uh, the Arctic. So um, the project uh, is actually um, focused on uh, tracking polar bears and their prey ice seals. So in 2016, American and Russian scientists began collaborative research on Wrangel Island on the bilateral treaty. By 2019, they have collected quite a lot of information and data on polar bears. And although 2020 saw more most field research projects 
unfortunately cancelled across the Arctic, but because of a unique collaboration that allowed research to continue in the Chukchi Sea, even uh, as the pandemic ground most activities around the world to a halt. So climate change uh, is the primary threat to polar bears and uh, it's good to have this type of collaboration uh, when we can exchange some information uh, and also to um, uh, cooperate effectively in the Arctic. So I hope you uh, have learned something about some recent <laughs> <laughs> findings. Polar bears. Thank you so much, Katya. That was fascinating. Very interesting about how we've learned from uh, the collaboration about the uh, oceans more than the atmosphere playing such an important role. And I bet you get a lot of people signed on with the polar bears, but we'll work, we'll work on that as a collaboration. But I wanted to turn to Pavel. Um, thank you for joining us, Pavel. And I know that you've just returned from the uh, conference on the Arctic. So interesting to hear some of the latest news. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, thank you, Katya and Anatole for your really interesting opening remarks. Um, I'm gonna give a little bit of a historical background uh, to US-Russia Arctic cooperation with a focus on science and research. And then I'll talk a little bit more about um, current cooperation and the Arctic Council. Uh, so I, um, I like to start by sharing that US-Russian science relations are even older than the United States. Um, in 1765, uh, America's founding father, Benjamin Franklin, wrote to what could be called his Russian uh, counterpart, also a polymath, uh, Mikhail Vasilievich Lomonosov. Uh, and he asked for an account of the discoveries of the polar voyage. Uh, here on the screen, I'm sharing pictures from the, the great northern expeditions that uh, Lomonosov took part in. And he wrote extensively about the Arctic uh, oceanography and the effects of the Aurora Borealis. Um, it's actually unclear whether Lomonosov received Franklin's letter uh, because the letter was dated a month before Lomonosov passed away, but historians say that this correspondence indicates that eminent American and Russian scientists were in contact and interested in sharing empirical findings even before the U.S. declared independence. And shortly after Franklin and Lomonosov um, established U.S.-Russia scientific relations, as historians say, uh, the U.S. and Russia engaged in numerous exchanges between uh, scientific societies, scientists, and private companies throughout the 19th century. And it was in this time as well that the American Philosophical Society, found, uh, founded by Franklin, and the St. Petersburg Academy of Sciences began electing honorary foreign members. Uh, after the Russian Revolution, uh, U.S.-Russia diplomatic relations were suspended but scientific contact actually remained, but at a, at a reduced level. Uh, and U.S.-Russia science cooperation didn't really return uh, to this high level um, during the 19th century until after Joseph Stalin's death in 1953. Uh, and it was in this time when the Academy of Sciences of the Soviet Union agreed to join what is often regarded as the most important uh, Arctic Science Cooperative Project of the 20th century, uh, the International Geophysical Year, uh, which went on between 1957 and 1958. Um, and this, this project opened the door to many different collaborations with the US and other participating countries. Uh, there were 67 countries that took part, including other Arctic states like Canada, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, uh, and Sweden. And in the Arctic, there were over 40 there were over 40 uh, research stations that were installed to study uh, weather at high latitudes, um, the movement of sea ice, and uh, the effects of the aurora borealis on radio interference. Uh, so on the left, you can see a map of, of the uh, Arctic research stations, part of the IGY. And on the right, um, it's a picture from Antarctica, uh, but I wanted to sh share it just because it shows uh, American and Soviet scientists uh, together as part of the IGY. Um, and, and during the Cold War, uh, there were many agreements signed between um, Reagan and Gorbachev, for example, the US-USSR agreement on cooperation in the field of environmental protection in 1972. 
and the 1986 Reykjavik summit devoted uh, special attention to Arctic cooperation and uh, eventually led to the production of a joint US-USSR study called Prospects for Future Climate. And um, this, this report even holds, up to, um, even holds up today, according to uh, our contemporary climatologists. Uh, so the end of the Cold War saw a rise in scientific exchanges between the U.S. and USSR, um, and this is especially because there was a lack of data on most of the Arctic, uh, and so there are many National Science Foundation projects that are funded, uh, such as uh, NABOS that uh, Katya mentioned earlier. Uh, and um, after the Cold War, um, when Medvedev and Obama were presidents, uh, there was the Bilateral Presidential Commission. Um, also contributed to uh, a rise in U.S.-Russia science cooperation. And so some of the noteworthy examples are uh, Rusalka. Rusalka means mermaid in Russian, uh, but it stands for the Russian-American Long-Term cons uh, Census of the Arctic. Um, NABOS, uh, one of the great um, international projects, Mosaic, uh, also involving uh, scientists from China and other um, uh, uh, huge countries. Uh, and the Russian American Initiative for Land Shelf Environments. Um, and these photos show uh, the start of Rusalka. Um, at the top, you can see Russian and American scientists from um, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, uh, signing agreements with uh, Russian scientists from the Russian Academy of Sciences. And the, and the photo on the bottom is from NABOS, uh, Russian and American scientists, in front of a Russian icebreaker, Kapitan Dranitsyn. Um, and I'll just want to talk a little bit about Rusalka uh, because it was the only U.S. program uh, which had access to both the U.S. and Russian territories at the same time. Uh, and Russian scientists talk about how lucky they were to work with Americans who have the excellent um, uh, measurement instruments. Uh, it's famous that NASA has excellent capabilities in studying the atmosphere and climate. Uh, and Americans talk about how they benefit from working with Russians because Russia has greater capabilities when it comes to icebreakers. Uh, Russia has over 50 icebreakers and are constructing new nuclear icebreakers, while the U.S. Uh, has plans, um, uh, had plans to build six new icebreakers, but now is currently working on one and a half, perhaps. Uh, and so. Um, also, as, a, as an Arctic nation, Russia has a long history of exploring and studying the Arctic. Uh, there's a really good book um, uh, recently out by a, a professor from Pomona College, uh, Pei Yi Chu, called The Life of Permafrost. It's all about how um, the Russian Empire and the USSR dealt with thawing permafrost and devoted lots of energy and resources to understanding it. So um, basically, uh, it's... it's um, you know, there's a rationale for working with Russia in the Arctic because of just a you know centuries of understanding of the climactic changes. Um, scientists that took part in Rusalka also even said that the program exists uh, quote as a miracle uh, because in the context of the geopolitical competition that's going on in the Arctic, uh, Rusalka had to overcome many political barriers. Uh, Rusalka is also viewed as um, the most important climate program as part of the Obama and Medvedev bilateral um, presidential commission. And, and so I like to talk about this uh, science cooperation, um, and it's in the context of climate change, but it's important to remember that scientists aren't going to fix the climate issue, that most of uh, the climate change which is happening in the Arctic um, originates from emissions that come from other parts of the world, not in the Arctic, but science cooperation can uh, help with adapting to climate change. And if we are to do a form of geoengineering, as Anatole mentioned, uh, we have to work with other scientists that understand the environment, the changes, and uh, put resources together uh, to adapt to the climate crisis, which is emerging. And also, uh, beyond just scientific results, um, diplomacy. This is, this is a form of diplomacy. Science cooperation can have a positive impact on stability and security, uh, even despite uh, international tensions. Um, if um, American and Soviet scientists were able to work together during the Cold War, they should be able to um, nowadays as well. Uh, science cooperation can improve diplomatic relations by keeping communication channels open 
when diplomatic communications are reduced or non-existent. And that brings me to uh, the Arctic Council. Um, and uh, this is why this discussion is in incredibly timely. Uh, Russia has just assumed chairmanship of this international organization, the Arctic Council, in May 2021. Uh, after Iceland had a two-year term, Russia will now chair the Arctic Council for two years, meaning it will lead the organization's agenda regarding sustainable development and environmental protection in the Arctic. And so uh, the Arctic Council shows that the Arctic states have a long history of working together. Um, it's even regarded as sometimes as the greatest example of, of, um, of a peace um, after the Cold War. Um, it's, an ex uh, it's an intergovernmental forum that acts by consensus. So all eight Arctic states have to agree on, on what they're negotiating and what they're putting forward um, between the Arctic states, representatives of indigenous peoples and NGOs. Um, it was inspired by Gorbachev's Murmansk initiative and even nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize uh, because of how it successfully enabled uh, the agreements on uh, search and rescue operations in the Arctic in 2011, uh, marine oil pollution preparedness and response, and on enhancing international uh, Arctic science collaboration in 2017. So it's seen as an exemplar of cooperation, peace, and stability. Uh, and um, um, in these photos, you can see um, on the top left, that's from the uh, Arctic Council ministerial meeting in 2019. Um, at the top right, that's the most recent Arctic Council meeting um, in May of this year. Uh, and the most recent meeting was also the first time that Lavrov met Blinken. Uh, it was um, in this year as well that uh, the Arctic Council adopted its first ever 10-year strategic plan. Uh, and this is significant because um, in the uh, 2019 meeting in Finland uh, during the Trump administration, uh, the Arctic Council failed to sign a joint declaration for the first time in history. Um, there was no agreement uh, officially because of um, because uh, Pompeo, who was uh, the U.S.'s um, Arctic official, uh, took issue with mention of the word climate in the agreement. Um, but scholars uh, uh, say that it's more due to tensions in U.S.-China relations, as well as U.S.-Russia relations, as Pompeo um, in an infamous speech uh, called um, Russia, uh, um, uh, Russia's actions in, in the Arctic uh, aggressive and rejected China's claim to being a near Arctic state. And um, as part of uh, Russia's Arctic Council chairmanship, uh, they are uh, working on uh, um, enhancing international cooperation um, and beyond um, what has been uh, discussed already in terms of uh, science cooperation, um, I mean, um, um, expeditions in the Arctic, they're also planning on establishing uh, the uh, Snowflake um, International Arctic Stations in both the Yamal Nenets Autonomous Okrug and in Murmansk Oblast. Um, and so Russia chairing the council opens up an opportunity um, for, for the US to get involved in um, Arctic Arctic science cooperation beyond just the Fulbright Arctic Initiative, for example, um, because uh, this snowflake um, Arctic station is planned to be a fully autonomous uh, year round um, renewable energy based facility um, that will enable uh, international cooperation between engineers, researchers, scientists and students working on solutions to the issues opposed by climate change. Uh, just one example, um, uh, and also another example of what we could work on during Russia's Arctic Council chairmanship. Um, uh, my colleague Katya has already talked about um, the importance of looking at permafrost. Um, Katya has also written a lot about um, the importance of data sharing regarding permafrost thaw with her uh, Russian and American colleagues. I, I believe in the journal Nature. I really recommend that article to everyone. Uh, but this is, I want to show you uh, what permafrost thaw is all about, what it looks like, um, and um, as Anatole mentioned, uh, the, the risks of, of methane bubbling up from thawed permafrost. Uh, the picture on the left is from Alaska, the picture on the right is from Russia, and the New York Times um, had an article about this uh, where they said land in Russia's Arctic 
blows like a bottle of champagne because when this methane um, leaks out of the thawed permafrost, it explodes uh, and causes this crater. Um, I think there are even some, situ um, some scenarios in the Russian Arctic where livestock have been injured or even killed by these explosions. Uh, and as, as the climate crisis intensifies, these kinds of explosions are gonna get worse and worse. Um, and here's another uh, possibility for US-Russia cooperation in the Arctic. Um, there is an article in uh, Foreign Policy magazine titled, The Woolly Mammoth's Return Could Thaw Relations with Russia. And this is a fascinating project um, where uh, a scientist from Harvard Medical School is working with uh, Russian scientists Sergei and Nikita Zimov uh, from uh, Siberia to bring back the woolly mammoth. Um, the mammoth has been uh, extinct for thousands of years, um, but uh, they propose um, using uh, genetic material uh, such as um, um, on the right hand side, there's a picture of a baby mammoth. Um, I took this picture in the uh, Salehard Museum I just returned from, uh, and this was a, a perfect uh, um, a genetic specimen for scientists to look at and to be able to uh, to perhaps bring back a mammoth by using um, a live elephant, but genes from a mammoth. And uh, uh, there's a photo of uh, Sergei Zimov um, wearing a mammoth shirt, um, and he's said to be the most cited Russian earth scientist. Uh, um, he's been working on rewilding uh, the Arctic uh, with several species, and this is like a, a picture, a mock-up of what that could look like. Uh, of species that formerly inhabited the northern grasslands, such as the, the musk ox and the plains bison. And uh, the reason why they want to bring back the mammoth and rewild these species is that they argue that the reintroduction of grazing species, uh, herbivores, uh, will restore the grasslands, uh, increase biodiversity, and especially these giant uh, herbivores um, uh, that stomp on the north um, on the northern grasslands will compact the soil so that permafrost will freeze more deeply in the winter. Uh, so it's, um, it's an effort to, to reverse the thaw of permafrost. Um, but actually, uh, the ethics of reviving a mammoth um, are still being debated. But I wanted to share this because it's a, it's a colorful example um, because um, there are scientists from Harvard working with the Siberian scientists um, and it's, it's only beginning and, we're, um, and we'll see how it ends up. Um, and here is my last slide um, uh, about why we're talking about this, why science cooperation and diplomacy are important. These are just some headlines from the last two years about the military activity in the Arctic. So the last two years has seen unprecedented military activity since the end of the Cold War. Um, there was uh, in in 2020, for the first time since the end of the Cold War, US, UK, and French warships entered the Barents Sea, uh, which is Russia's backyard. Um, and a few months later, uh, the Russian Navy um, had military exercises off the coast of Alaska, uh, even startling some, Alas um, some Alaskan fishermen. Um, and so there's this trend in media as well as academia, but it's more so in the media, uh, pushing this idea of a, of a coming conflict in the Arctic. Um, and so uh, um, I just wanna stress that this idea of science cooperation can build trust, can improve confidence in the region and stability. Um, and so there's a historical background for US-Russia Arctic cooperation. Uh, there are some challenges uh, like military and, and diplomatic tensions, uh, but there are lots of opportunities for cooperation, in, especially in permafrost research and even perhaps in bringing back the woolly mammoth. So thank you very much for your attention. Pavel, thank you for that uh, really remarkable uh, sense of scientific cooperation through history and what it could mean today. Um, I think it's, uh, you've set out many tasks for Acura uh, and it was very compelling. It is 12.55, so I was going to take the liberty, Cynthia, of just asking Anatole, Katya, and Pavel to say a closing word commenting on this large frame of our conversation about cooperation. 
um, and why it's so important and what opportunities we heard today, because you're so right, Pavel, the media often skew uh, this as a conflict for geopolitical competition, as opposed to what we heard from you and we should develop. And may there be another thaw. There's a political, there was a political thaw. We now need all kinds of thaws, but Anatole, um, from your perspective, you're thinking about how this could be built on. Well, I suppose just to say again, that I find the, um, uh, the concentration of, I mean, our security establishments are paid to do it. Uh, the sad thing is that so much of our media and think tanks who are not supposed to be paid to do it, um, you know, stress these security issues in the Arctic, which are so utterly irrelevant, actually, you know, to, to the interests of our countries, to the interests of humankind, um, and, uh, you know, distract attention from what we've heard today, these great opportunities yeah. uh, for, I mean, great opportunities for scientific cooperation, but uh, also essential chances for um, scientific cooperation uh, in areas which really are critical, you know, to, to the future of um, humanity in general, but also to the future of, um, of America and the United States. So I very much hope um, that, uh, you know, the, the work of Katya and of, of Pavel will uh, be much more widely known um, in, uh, in Russia, in the United States and across the world. Thank you. And Katya, thank you for your terrific presentation. So much more to say, but would be interested in your perspective um, on where we might go from here based on the work you've done, Pavel have, has done. All right, uh, so thank you so much again. And uh, well, yes, uh, so scientific communities in the Arctic uh, context have been widely recognized in uh, identifying uh, problems, uh, sharing policy agendas, uh, and uh, advocating for greater uh, coordination between Arctic and um, even non-Arctic stakeholders. And I would like to mention again that the 2017 agreement on enhancing international Arctic scientific cooperation, which is also called the Fairbanks Agreement, was a notable miles, milestone for the Arctic Council and also for the scientific community. So uh, we have so many opportunities and of course we have a lot of obstacles uh, and among them political tensions between countries. But uh, I tell you, I have met so many young scientists uh, with uh, open eyes and uh, absolutely a uh, huge massive interest uh, uh, to study the Arctic and study the impacts of the climate change that I just uh, would like to advise uh, for the scientific community and for both countries that the US and the Russia should continue to pursue joint research projects focused on the Arctic across a number of scientific disciplines to reduce the economic costs of research, first of all, and to benefit from uh, one another scientific uh, expertise and of course to increase diplomatic engage uh, engagement on uh, uncontroversial issues, which is also important. And uh, of course, we are ready to study the Arctic and we are ready to collaborate. Uh, and uh, we are very much excited about this. Thank you. Thank you for that hopeful note also about the younger generation of scientists, which we should be in contact with. And Pavel, you. Um, that is both a very catchy beginning with Benjamin Franklin and Mikhail Lomonosov and a woolly ending with woolly mammoths. <laughs> you may have to take that on the road. <laughs> I guarantee you, I mean, I don't think people have a sense of these opportunities. I mean, it's just, I, the Arctic Council is viewed as one, a place of another geopolitical competition, maybe because of the media, maybe because Pompeo got attention, but I think it's so critical to understand the opportunities, even with the obstacles. But I turn to you, Pavel. Uh, just, I, I'm just curious, was the atmosphere better at the last session that you attended? It had to have been 
Yeah, so um, so I'll just share that. Uh, so I came back from the Yamal Peninsula. Uh, um, as, um, I attended a conference called the Arctic Dialogue, uh, which was organized as part of uh, Russia's Arctic Council chairmanship, um, together with some Russian think tanks, uh, the Russian International Affairs Council. Um, and so we had uh, Russia's Arctic Council chair, um, Nikolai Korchunov, was there at the opening ceremony. So it was a very official Arctic Council related event. Um, and I came away with a lot of optimism uh, because most of the attendees were, were young students, uh, graduate students, uh, young professionals. And I really saw that Russians are really concerned um, with, with the state of US-Russia relations, especially in the Arctic. Um, I was actually the only American there. Uh, there were some Norwegians, uh, uh, there was um, someone from Canada, um, but uh, um, I'll, um, I was happy to, to really you know, share my perspective on, on how many opportunities there are for US-Russia cooperation. We've talked about uh, science a lot in this session, but there's lots, you know, I, I briefly mentioned search and rescue. Um, and also we've been talking about the Bering Strait for Peace Festival, uh, a mm -hmm. cultural form of cooperation um, where uh, Russia is going to open the border between Chukotka and Alaska, which is uh, truly amazing, um, yeah. you know, in this time of geopolitical tensions. Um, and so there's lots of opportunities, you know, um, and uh, one thing I would add is that um, whenever we hear Blinken, Lavrov, Biden, Putin talking about U.S.-Russia cooperation, the Arctic is always mentioned in passing. Uh, and just oh, and we could walk, you know, um, and we could work in um, in the area of climate change, and we could work in in the Arctic. But there are lots of opportunities, um, and it's up to us as analysts, as concerned citizens, to pressure our politicians and really rem and remind them that you know there are opportunities, and it shouldn't just be something in passing, you know, something just to mention. There are lots of opportunities, and hopefully, it will build stability and security and peace and address the climate crisis. We couldn't end on a better note. So I'm grateful to all of you for participating. Uh, I certainly learned a lot today and uh, of opportunities. We know the obstacles, but thank you all and uh, onwards. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thanks a lot. It was really fascinating. Yeah, I think it was. Uh, and many opportunities. I hope we will be in touch. I'm in touch with Anatole. He has the cover story of the nation next week, but I'd, I'd love to be in touch, Pavel and Katya. Thank you, Cynthia. And good to see you, Nadia. Take care. Bye. Thank, Thank you, you very Gina. much. It was wonderful. Yeah, really. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.